Hello, nature lovers, and welcome to another exciting episode of Environmental Systems and Societies. Today, we're going to look at our second part of conservation of biodiversity, and we've got some key points we're going to look at, and really, we're looking at how a species uh, conserved one at a time, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of that. And to look at that, we're going to look at three things. The CITES Agreement, which is an organization that protects trade of endangered species. Captive breeding in zoos, is that a good way to protect animals? And uh, seed banks and botanical gardens, is that a good way to protect plants? So let's start with CITES. CITES is all about the Convention uh, on International Trade in Endangered Species and Wild Fauna and Flora. It was started back in the 60s. They, made, they meet every three years, and it's 170 countries that come together and hammer out agreements with each other about trade of endangered species, both animals and plants, for the pet trade, for the garden trade, for the medicinal trade, for the zoo trade, for the circus trade, um, and certainly for products made from animals. They have spent the last 40 years um, protecting the shipment of endangered species around the globe. That doesn't mean that none can be moved. They can, it depends on the situation. And there's three situations. So the first one is, if it's seriously endangered, it can't be moved. And so that's appendix one. We just don't trade in it. Type two is we can trade it, but it is under certain strict guidelines so that we keep the population sustainable. And the third type is maybe globally it's not endangered, but in a certain country it is, and so we try and protect it. This is shark fin soup and it is made by the cutting off the fin of a shark. The problem is, is that they cut off the fin of the shark and then leave the rest of the shark to die in the ocean. It's not sustainable whatsoever. When you think of 30% of the sharks on the planet have, are endangered or threatened, and last year we still killed 70 million sharks just for their fins for soup. That's an example of something sites would try to stop and protect. Um, so zoos are how we primarily protect animals and there is some captive breeding stuff where you know it's not displayed to the public but a lot of this is displayed to the public so they kind of have to go with two masters we're trying to protect genetic diversity we're trying to promote uh animal um biodiversity but at the same time we're trying to sell tickets to our zoo to have money to do those first things so you've got to it, it a lot of times just by showing off the animals you limit what you can do and uh so that can, be a, that can be a weakness for how to protect animals. Uh, sometimes zoos focus so much on showing them off that they treat them poorly. And sometimes they work really hard, they actually get ones born, but they can't reintroduce them to the wild because they don't know how to live in the wild. Or worse yet, they know how to live in the wild because they've been taught, but there is no wild to put them back into. So these are issues with uh, weaknesses, if you will, with the zoo model. But there's strengths too. Even though they struggle and they're not incredibly efficient and, they, and they're very expensive, they, they have had ex uh, examples where it's worked. So the California condor, um, the black-footed ferret, which was considered extinct but was reintroduced and now is doing well again. Uh, there you go. These are all things that are doing well. Um, our zoo, Dickerson Park Zoo, with our elephants here, our Asian elephants, is a nationally recognized breeding program. We were the first to artificially inseminate an Asian elephant in the whole world. So, you know, every zoo's doing its part, or lots are, and ours is no exception. Botanical gardens and seed banks, that's how we protect plants. Now, botanical garden, it's kind of like a zoo in that they often put out lots of plants for display for people to see and photograph and, and just kind of reflect with. And consequently then, it also uh, it promotes education like a zoo does, but it limits maybe where you grow it or how you grow it and so forth like that. And you have to make it pleasing to the public. Um, and people pick it, they walk on it, they, they steal it. You know, it's not a done deal. So another way that people protect these things is by creating seed banks. And that's what I'm showing you pictures of right now. And literally what they are, are this is one set up in the Arctic, uh, about 50 miles from the North Pole outside of Sweden, or Finland, I believe. And they collect seeds from all the known plants around the world, catalog them, and keep them here. As you can imagine, this is an incredibly expensive thing. But the cold protects them for a long, 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 long time. And uh, then if they're needed, they can be used. But, you know, here's the problem with that. Uh, that costs a lot of money. Who's going to pay for that money? Who's going to pay for that? And then if somebody needs 
a plant that has gone extinct in their country, uh, that the people on that seed bank may charge more money than you have to give you those seeds. So it becomes a, a deal. But to make a complex like this, there's an artist rendering of it going back in the mountain. It is incredibly expensive. So there's kind of, how do you pay for that? You know, should this be something the whole world's doing together? We all chip in money. What, you know, how do we protect this diversity? It's hard to say, but there's a local guy in Mansfield named Jerry Gettle who owns Baker Creek uh, Seed with his wife and they are, they're doing it their way. And they are basically, they collect seeds from all around the world. They put it together in this catalog here. Here's an example that comes out every year. And they they have five to 10,000 different kind of plants in here that promote biodiversity in our food supply. So instead of one type of corn or one type of tomato, there's two to 300 types of tomatoes and 50 types of corn that you can plant. He's, he started stores on each coast. This one's in California. He literally bought an old bank and he calls it the seed bank, which I just think is awesome. And, uh, and his whole idea is for us to try different kinds of fruits and vegetables that we never would have tried on our own. So that is a whirlwind tour of conservation of biodiversity part two. We looked at conservation-based practices and what are their strengths and weaknesses. I hope it all made sense. If it didn't, please talk to me. Otherwise, peace out, homie. Kingfisher. <laughs>